we have breaking news as we come on the air because in just minutes, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy will meet to try to stop the global economy from going into chaos. What we expect out of today's talks and a look at a potential last ditch move from the White House. Also tonight, why the man accused of killing four University of Idaho students refusing to say whether he's guilty in court. More on what we saw but did not hear from Brian Koberger. Plus, one of the country's top civil rights groups has a travel tip for you this summer. Do not go to Florida. Will that warning actually put a dent in the state's powerful tourism industry and Ron DeSantis' 2024 hopes? Then, new research out today shows women are nearly three times as likely to die from a heart attack as men. Why? In part, because doctors are just missing key health issues. We'll explain that for you. And Uber is rolling out a new feature that will let teens call their own rides. But has it worked out the safety kinks to satisfy concerned parents? We're looking at that a little bit later in the show. Hey, everybody, I'm Aaron Gilchrist in for Halley, and we have breaking news this hour. In the next half hour or so, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy head to head in the Oval Office. Will they come out with a debt limit deal that could stop a global economic catastrophe in just about 10 days now? This is what is at stake in Washington right now as you look live at the White House here. Any minute now, we could see the two lead negotiators in these talks make, to try to make sure the U.S. can pay its bills. And in the last half hour or so, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is out with a new letter to congressional leaders reminding them that the U.S. is going to run out of cash, potentially as early as June 1st, if they don't act. And right now, the lines of communication are a bit frayed. You see White House negotiators at the Capitol earlier today. That meeting broke up after about three hours of talking. The speaker says there is more work to be done. Decisions have to start being made. Uh, I mean, they're 10 days out. Now, we expect the speaker to come out and talk after the meeting with the president today. Not super clear right now if the president is going to speak today as well, but we have a lot of questions to go through here. First, the obvious one, right? Can President Biden and Speaker McCarthy cut a deal? All signs point to maybe not today, at least. So another question, how does a deal or how would a deal reshape how the government spends your tax dollars and all the stuff the country needs right now? Then there is the political question, right? Can McCarthy get his five-seat Republican majority to go along with a bipartisan agreement? And can Senate Democrats line up behind President Biden's push? Last question may be the nuclear option here. Will the president use an untested legal theory that some in his party want him to use to stop the potential catastrophe without Congress? We'll have a little bit more on that a little bit later. Let's start in Washington. Monica Alba is at the White House for us. Garrett Haig is on Capitol Hill. We'll begin with the president's view here, Monica. It, it, it sounds like the negotiators couldn't really move the needle enough with Republicans over the weekend. Uh, we're, and and the, the, there's this vibe we're getting from the White House right now Talk to us here. Is the deal not too likely to come tonight? It doesn't seem like it's going to really coalesce in the next couple of hours, Aaron, but the hope from the president and the White House is that they will get a little bit closer potentially. You did have the president last night speaking to Speaker McCarthy on Air Force One as he was flying back from Japan, calling those talks productive. Speaker McCarthy was the one who first, you know, issued that kind of optimism saying a deal could come together as early as tonight or tomorrow. But I'm told by the White House that we shouldn't be bracing for any major agreement or any kind of firm handshake outline of a deal by the end of tonight's meeting. And why is that? Likely because there are still just a bunch of areas that these two men aren't going to be able to come together and agree on in a likely one-hour meeting in the Oval Office just a short time from now. Instead, it seems the two of them could come out of that meeting saying, we both agree we want to avoid default, but how they get there is still a path that is just not completely charted by the White House. Now, it's possible we'll also hear from the president afterwards. He did speak after the last couple of congressional leader meetings in some fashion. So we'll have to wait to see what both sides say here. But the White House telling me they, of course, know that the limited runway that's left to get this done before June 1st is the most important aspect to all of this. So if we look at some of the details, and I'm going to put a graphic up on the screen for folks to, to sort of follow along with us here, Monica, we know that one of the big issues is uh, on the debt limit, obviously. But then there's also this question about spending caps. There are work requirements for government programs we've heard about, uh, raising new revenue streams, and then the literal length of time of this deal, whatever deal they may come up with. Uh, where does the White House stand on all that? 
Yeah, and those are really important key pillars of this. And just as you put up on that graphic, there's a lot there. And again, that's going to be difficult for them to agree on almost any of those pieces in this meeting. But it's what negotiators have spent the last couple of days and likely will go back to the drawing board on in some instances tomorrow. You raise the issue of spending and new revenue. This is a major question about how these two men who see this issue completely ideologically differently are going to come together and agree on spending. The White House has said that they are open to some spending cuts, but overall Republicans have said they want way, way more than what's currently on the table. So talking about a budget, is it something that's going to last two years? Is this something, again, that we're going to be just kicking the can down the road on with the debt ceiling issue and something the president's going to have to revisit again? All of that remains to be talked about in that room. All right, we'll see what comes out of it. Monica Alba for us near the White House. Let's go down to the other end of the National Mall now. Garrett Hake at his post on Capitol Hill. So, Garrett, same question, but from the Republican lens on this, because, you know, as we heard, McCarthy told you decisions have to be made, right? That was what he said. How far mm -hmm. apart does he see his Republicans uh, and the White House on some of those key issues? Well, the challenge here is that on the, some of the smaller issues, they're not that fall, far apart, but you can't decide the smaller things until you decide the biggest thing, which is those spending levels that Monica was outlining. House Republicans want to make sure that next year we spend less money in real terms than we spent this year, which means cuts. And the problem that they face now is all the things they've taken off the table for cuts leave very little room to cut elsewhere. So if you're not going to cut Medicare or Social Security, the two biggest drivers of federal spending, that's off the table. Well, what about the Department of Defense? Well, McCarthy also said today they're not going to cut defense spending. That means all the cuts they want to make fall on domestic programs, the kinds of things that Democrats really want to spend money on and want to support. So if you're in a situation where you need a bipartisan deal to lift the debt ceiling, which both parties have agreed they now do, but you're only cutting stuff Democrats like and you're not willing to close any tax loopholes or raise taxes like Monica was outlining, you're in real trouble and you are very far apart. And that's the state of play as we get ready for this meeting to begin. So do you have any early lean on what's going to come out of this? I mean, every time that we've seen these talks happen with, at the White House, Speaker McCarthy comes out to the microphones maybe 30, 45 minutes after that meeting starts. The, the tone has been, you know, really all over the place since Friday. What do you expect to see if McCarthy does come out and, and speak uh, outside the White House today? Both of these politicians are natural deal makers. They are similar in style in the sense that they want people to come away thinking that they got something. They want people coming away feeling like they're making progress. Well, I guarantee we will hear from McCarthy after he leaves the White House. It wouldn't surprise me if we hear from him both at the White House and back here at the Capitol. And I suspect he will take a positive tone. He will suggest that they have made progress. Where they have run into trouble in these negotiations, really from the jump, has been translating in the meeting Bonamy into on-the-ground agreement on policy details. The other thing McCarthy's been doing over the weekend and into today is kind of ratcheting up the timing pressure, Aaron, reminding folks that even when they get a deal, it's going to take some time to turn a deal into a bill that can pass both chambers. I suspect he'll do the same thing here to try to squeeze the president, saying, look, even, in, even with me as the speaker trying to yeah. get to a deal, I need you to agree to something soon or we're just going to run out of time. All right, going to be a late night for you. Garrett Hake for us at the Capitol today. Garrett, thank you. All right, let's take you to Idaho now with the man accused of stabbing and killing four University of Idaho students in court today for the first time since a grand jury indicted him. Look at this. Brian Koberger staying silent during his court appearance today, leading the judge there to enter not guilty pleas for the four murder charges that Koberger is facing. It's now been six months since the shocking killings and manhunt that gripped the country, really. This comes as NBC's Dateline exclusively reports detectives found evidence that Koberger went on Amazon to buy a, a K-bar knife and a sheath. That's according to a source with inside knowledge of the investigation here. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin is following all of this outside the courthouse uh, in Idaho and joins us now. So, Aaron, talk to us about what played out in, in the courtroom today and, and why Koberger stayed silent uh, when, when asked to enter a plea there. What comes next, too? Hey, Aaron. Well, we don't know why Brian Koberger chose to stay silent rather than entering a plea. I've been speaking to legal experts here in Idaho, and they say there's no 
overt, obvious tactical advantage to remaining silent, although they do note that it does allow him to exert some control over the timeline of the proceedings. Keep in mind that grand jury that met last week, they met in secret, and his defense has not had an opportunity to review any of those documents that took place in that secret closed-door proceeding. And so perhaps uh, his defense wanted to reserve the right to review those documents before formally entering a plea. It also, though, allows them to continue on. Once a plea is entered uh, on his behalf, which it was today, that means that under Idaho law, his trial must take place within six months. And today we heard from the judge uh, set that court date for October 2nd, tentatively, a trial that's expected to last some six weeks. It also forces the prosecution to turn their hand on the question of a death penalty. The prosecution is now required within 60 days time to declare whether or not they plan to pursue the death penalty, which legal experts that I've been speaking to say they do in fact expect to happen. Now, Aaron, we also mentioned this exclusive reporting from Dateline. What more do we know about this K-Bar knife and, and the sheath that Koberger allegedly bought? Well, not much, according to the source with knowledge of the investigation telling Dateline News, not much more than what they divulged. We know that, according to this source, Brian Koberger, in the months prior to the murders, uh, purchased a K-Bar knife uh, on Amazon with a sheath. That's potentially significant, considering authorities allege that all four murders were carried out with a K-Bar knife, the murder weapon, has yet to be found, although a knife sheath was found at the crime scene, which authorities allege they found Brian Koberger's DNA uh, on that knife sheath. Aaron. All right, Aaron McLaughlin for us uh, in Idaho today. Aaron, thank you for your reporting. Appreciate it. Let's turn to South Carolina now. Senator Tim Scott tonight speaking to NBC News. This is just hours after kicking off his 2024 presidential campaign, starting off a week that could see more big names jumping into the race as well. Scott telling NBC's Tom Yamas the kind of candidate he's going to be. Do you think GOP voters want someone carrying a Bible or do they want someone driving a bulldozer into the Democrats? What people really want is an optimistic, positive, conservative who has a backbone, but also believes that the best is yet to come. Scott, the only black Republican senator, now joins three other candidates who have held elected office, including, of course, the former president and frontrunner Donald Trump. We are getting the announcement just days before Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is expected to jump into the race, considered the, the biggest threat to uh, President Trump's chances at taking the nomination for a third time in a row. NBC's Ali Vitale joining us now from North Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, Ali, talk to us about uh, Mr. Scott's game plan here. What's he going to do to get people to start talking more about him and not so much about Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis? Well, look, I think it's always going to be true that Trump and DeSantis are really the two men to beat here, although Trump has clearly set his sights on someone like Ron DeSantis. And according to conversations that I've had with most of these other campaigns, either the ones that are announced or in waiting, they'd be fine if Trump was the one who actually took care of Ron DeSantis for them. And frankly, if you listen to the way the Trump campaign is talking about Tim Scott's entry into this race, they're trying to make it seem like everyone who enters the race from this point on sees DeSantis as fallible and see second place as wide open. Those are the words of the Trump campaign as they welcomed Tim Scott into the race at the end of last week. For Tim Scott, though, his senior officials tell me that it's less a chance for him to differentiate on message because they, they still say, and he said this again today, that he is a true conservative. They instead, though, think that he's going to be a different messenger with messages like this one. Listen. We, we need a president that persuades. We have to do that with common sense, conservative principles. But we have to have a compassion for people. We have to have a compassion for people who don't agree with us. 
So look, certainly that's what Tim Scott is going to be taking on the campaign trail. He's going to go back to Iowa and New Hampshire later this week, the first official stops to his presidential campaign. But even when he's not in those early states, when he's doing his other day job like I do on Capitol Hill, he is going to have the air cover that many candidates wish they had at this point in the race. And it points to Tim Scott's deep war chest. The fact that he's got more than $20 million cash on hand, advisors are not wasting any time putting that money to use, putting $6 million on the airwaves and on the radio waves. That's going to go up on Wednesday in Iowa and New Hampshire and not come down for the entirety of the summer. So you've got the ground game and the air game functioning in tandem from the start for Tim Scott. You know, I want to ask you about something you said uh, at sort of at the beginning there. We, we've got the former president who seems to be almost welcoming Scott into the fray here, right? Posting yeah. about him on Truth Social, wishing him luck in the race. Uh, at the same time, in the same breath, really going after his likely top rival, Ron DeSantis, calling him totally unelectable again. Yeah, it, in a weird sort of way, yeah. does it hurt a candidacy to not be seen as a threat and not be attacked by the front runner when you jump into the race? <laughs> You know, I feel like in any other world, I would say, yeah, your read on this, I 100 percent agree. But I think any candidate who can escape the ire of the former president for as long as they can is probably in a good position. I know a lot of candidates who have worked a lot harder to stay out of Trump's way. So the fact that Senator Tim Scott is able to do it just by simply staying above the fray and not immediately going the contrast route with the former president, I think that's notable. Whether or not it's a consistently tenable strategy, that's something that we'll have to wait and see, because there are many Republicans who say you can't take on Trump without actually taking on Trump. Scott's senior advisors, though, tell me that they're not eager to do that. They'll push back when they feel they need to, but they want him to be able to run his own race. He has consistently deflected and dodged questions about the ways that he's different from the former president. So for now, that seems like it'll be what he does. We'll see when he actually gets to the debate stage, though. All right. We'll be watching Ali Vitale for us in South Carolina today. Thank you. And you can see more of Tom Yamas' exclusive interview with Senator Scott tonight on NBC Nightly News and here on News Now on Top Story. States that rely on the Colorado River for water reached a crucial deal today to cut back on water usage. Under the proposed plan, three of those states, Arizona, California, Nevada, they're going to conserve at least three million acre feet of water by 2026. That's about uh, as much water as you could fill six million Olympic-sized pools with. A little before we came on the air here, President Biden said in a statement, uh, the deal is uh, an important step in our efforts to protect the stability of the Colorado River system. And it's important to point out just how vital the Colorado River really is. It supplies drinking water to 40 million people in seven states. It also irrigates 5.5 million acres of farmland and provides power through electricity generated by dams on the river's reservoirs. Now, this new deal should avoid the federal government from taking matters into its own hands. Last month, the Biden administration proposed steps it could take if states didn't reach a deal on their own. One of those was actually splitting water cuts evenly across those states. Let's bring in Dana Griffin now in our Los Angeles Bureau. So Dana, talk to us about what happens next now that we have this deal on the table between the states. Well, Aaron, as you mentioned, this staves off the government from having to add additional cuts. A little history here. The administration initially wanted two to four million acre feet cut per year. So this three million that's only being cut over the next three, it's 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 pretty um, it's significantly less than what we were anticipating. It also provides a one point two billion dollar incentive for these three states, California, Colorado and Nevada, because they agreed to conserve water. They could receive up to one point two billion dollars to go towards cities, to go towards agriculture and other infrastructure. So that's really important for them. So what happens next is the Interior Department will study the effects of this deal before officially adopting it and before moving forward with this plan. Well, you say the, the effects. So you talk about this being significantly less than what was anticipated or what was, what was possible. What sort of impact, real-world impact, could this have on the state's water supply? Is, is it going to be enough? So, Aaron, this could, can prevent the water supply from drying up in the West here because 
For years, we've seen climate, drought, and a growing population decrease the amount of water that's been available. And we haven't gotten to that critical low point yet. So that's been very interesting for people to, to, you know, to get to this point where we need uh, this water for these states to really take this seriously to make sure that we are not depleting that water supply. Now, these states could impose their own restrictions. Here in California, we know the governor of California has before created water restrictions where you can't water your grass on certain days. Mm -hmm. That could yeah. be an option so that we help to preserve some of that water. So what happens next is they they will start discussions. The, the leaders of these states and the federal government will start the discussions for what to do after 2026, because remember, this is still just a temporary fix. What happens after that is still, Aaron, a big question mark. All right, Dana Griffin for us in Los Angeles today. Thank you. Ukrainian forces tonight saying they are making progress by surrounding Russian troops in the key eastern city of Bakhmut. Now, this comes after Moscow declared it had captured Bakhmut over the weekend, gaining full control of that city. Russian state media calling it a, quote, liberation. President Vladimir Putin promising state rewards to those who distinguished themselves in the war's longest and bloodiest battle. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who spent the weekend rallying support from world leaders at the G7 summit in Japan, he had this to say when asked if the city was, in fact, under Russian control. I think no. But you have to, to understand that there is nothing. They destroyed everything. Bakhmut is only in our hearts. So just drowned and, and a lot of dead Russians. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins me now. Uh, Raf, the Russians are seeing this as a symbolic boost for President Putin, right, in his first really major victory on the battlefield in about a year. The Ukrainians, though, say that this is actually uh, not the case, that they're making progress in pushing the Russians out. Can you help us understand these sort of conflicting views? Yeah, Aaron, a lot of fog of war right now. We don't know exactly who controls which street in Bakhmut, but it is clear that the Russians are in control of the vast majority of the city at this point, or what's left of the city, because as President Zelensky said, the Russians have almost completely destroyed this city in the process of mounting their so-called liberation. Rewinding to Saturday, Evgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner mercenary group, whose troops have really been the tip of the spear, in terms of fighting for the Russian side in Bakhmut. He says that they have taken full control of the city. A day later, Vladimir Putin chimes in. He says this is a great victory for the Russian people. Interestingly, Bakhmut has seen real tension between the Wagner mercenaries and the regular Russian army. And Prigozhin is now saying that his troops, having taken the city, are going to leave as early as Thursday and hand it over to the regular Russian military. Take a listen to a little bit of what he had to say. There are lines of defense on the western outskirts now. Therefore, PMC Wagner is going to leave Artumovsk from May 25th to June 1st. Now, from the Ukrainian side, they say they are still fighting on the outskirts of the city. They are trying to flank the Russians from the north and the south. We will see how well that works. But, Aaron, it is worth remembering, Bakhmut was always more symbolic than it was strategic. And from the Ukrainian perspective, even if they have been pushed out of the city, they really feel like they achieved something here because they bogged down the Russian forces for a very long time, and they say they killed a whole lot more Russians than they lost. Nobody knows exactly how many troops were killed on either side. But one Ukrainian official said to me when I was in the country a few months ago that they believed they were killing seven Russian soldiers for every one Ukrainian they lost in Bakhmut. Aaron. You know, Raf, we have less than a minute here, but I do want to ask you, Z Zelensky is getting more support from the G7. We, you know he was there this weekend. President Biden committing to sending those F-16 fighter jets. Germany announcing a big military aid package for Ukraine last week. How big of an impact is all this making or going to make at this point? 
I think going to make is the key phrase. A lot of this stuff has still not reached the battlefield, right? Just taking the F-16s, there is now an agreement that the NATO allies will train Ukrainian pilots and will eventually provide F-16s, but we don't know how long that's going to take. We don't know who is providing those F-16s. The big test, Aaron, will be when this long-awaited Ukrainian counteroffensive begins. We will see how effectively the Ukrainians are able to put the new equipment that they already Already have in their arsenal to use. And so that is what Western capitals are watching right now. Aaron. Right. Raf Sanchez for us overseas today. Raf, thank you. And still ahead this hour, TikTok now suing over Montana's ban on the popular app, why they claim it violates the First Amendment. Plus, another giant leap toward commercializing space travel inside the mission that just arrived at the International Space Station. An entire city brought to a halt by volcanic ash. That's ahead in our five things. First, though, a private mission to space making history today when four astronauts, including three paying customers, docked at the International Space Station. Take a look. You can see them here, the crew on this private flight by SpaceX and Axiom, docking with the ISS, meeting the astronauts who were already there. Uh, the flight crew includes two American and two Saudi Arabian astronauts and a bunch of firsts for this group, too. The first Saudi woman to ever uh, enter orbit and visit the space station. The first time a female astronaut has commanded a private space mission. And then take a look at this. It's the first time SpaceX landed a Falcon 9 booster back on the launch site. Look at it coming down here early this morning instead of uh, having to land on a barge, which is the normal thing, out in the ocean. Pretty cool to see. The astronauts are going to be doing some research, uh, doing some experiments during their eight-day visit as well. Marissa Parra is joining us now from the Florida coast. So, Marissa, this is a, a big step toward commercializing spaceflight, right? Uh, it, it's going to make spaceflight more widely accessible. At least that's the idea. That is the idea. Now, Axiom wants to be the face of the first commercial space station. They have these big dreams and plans for a business park of sorts in space. But just as you mentioned, this really is a bigger part of this huge race that's happening right now as we speak, the race to commercialize space and eventually make life multiplanetary. I wanted to come in at this early stage as we're developing the uh, methods to take I would say ordinary people or people that are non-traditional governmental astronauts to space and to develop the role that we would play. So that was John Schaffner who you were hearing from. He's operating as a pilot on this mission that just launched yesterday. And that's an example of someone who would not have been able to go into space even just a few years ago. Partially is able to because he has the money to do so, Aaron. But again, something that is only newly possible. So you talk about the money here. I do wonder what else we know about the people who are on this crew. And then what do you know about how much this sort of a trip, a private trip like this is costing? Yeah, and that's an interesting question, but we have to start first. When we look at the crew, we got to start with Peggy Whitson. I mean, this is someone who is a decorated former NASA astronaut. She holds a serious title, the most amount of days spent in space. Before this mission, 665 days. And she is the first female commander of a private space mission, as you just mentioned. But everyone else is new to space. We have the two Saudi astronauts right there on your screen, Ali Al Karni, Rayana Barnawi, and she also becomes the first Saudi woman on the internet. National Space Station that happened this morning officially. Um, and both of them are sponsored by the Saudi government. Um, John Schaffner, a businessman, lifetime aviator, was able to fund himself. We talk about the expenses of this. Well, here's the thing. Axiom doesn't have to tell us. They are a private company. This is a private mission. So all we have to go off of is the price tag from the last launch, that last mission, $55 million a pop. So we talk about the race to commercialize space. Certainly not currently an inexpensive one, but I guess the idea is the more they do this, the more people come on board, that price tag will come down. Hopefully a little bit more if anyone at home is trying to go up. Maybe our great-great-grandchildren will get to go up when it's a little yeah. cheaper. <laughs> a lot cheaper. Marissa Parra for us uh, in Florida today. Thank you. Now, we do want to stay on the topic of space for a moment here. NBC's Tom Costello has a new special report on how NASA is responding to the challenge of reaching Mars before China does, and they're doing it by reviving an old program from the 60s. Now, this explores how rockets powered by a nuclear reactor might be our ticket to getting to Mars faster 
and setting up a human presence there in the next few decades. I want you to hear how these rockets are being built. So what is this here? This is, this is a nuclear test chamber. This is where they put components of nuclear thermal rockets, such as this fuel element here, and like the one that you're holding. These are the building blocks for America's future nuclear propulsion going to space. Yes. DARPA program manager Dr. Tabitha Dawson has pulled out the old blueprints and dusted off the test engines from the 1960s. Now you can catch the full Meet the Press reports special, Race to Mars. It's on demand on Peacock and on YouTube. All right, let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, TikTok just filing a federal lawsuit against the state of Montana after that state passed a law that bans people from downloading the app within its borders. The Chinese-owned social media company is saying in a statement that it believes the ban violates the First Amendment. The state's governor signed that ban last week, and it's supposed to go into effect in January. Number two, Nebraska's Republican governor just signing a bill that bans abortions at 12 weeks, effective immediately. It also is going to restrict gender-affirming care for people under 19 years old. That starts October 1st. Opponents are promising to sue and try and block the new restrictions. Number three, a new study suggesting a new weight loss drug made by Pfizer may be as effective as that hugely popular Ozempic. Pfizer saying its version can be taken as a pill instead of an injection. The results found that patients who took the drug lost an average of 10 pounds over four months. Number four, Mount Etna, the volcano in Sicily erupting this weekend, blanketing parts of the island in a layer of ash. Flights to the Sicilian city of Catania were temporarily stopped because of debris and, and low visibility. Look at this guy's car. Mount Etna is one of Europe's most active volcanoes. It hasn't erupted, though, or had a major eruption, I should say, since 1922. Number five, it is the end of an era for basketball superstar Carmelo Anthony. He announced his retirement today after 19 seasons. His accomplishments include an NCAA championship, 10 all-star selections, three Olympic gold medals, and the number nine spot in the all-time NBA scoring. Melo was recently honored as one of the NBA's 75 greatest players of all time for the league's 75th anniversary. I think he turns 39 next week. Good time to retire if you're a professional athlete. <laughs> Meta facing a record $1.3 billion fine in Europe over sending and storing data on EU users to the U.S. Now, the group that oversees Meta's privacy operations in the European, Un Un European Union saying Facebook was illegally storing data on its servers in the U.S. It claims the company failed to protect the personal information of European citizens from American security services. Now, it's the biggest fine the EU regulators have ever handed down. Big tech companies have been vulnerable to legal challenges for sending data between the EU and the U.S. since a deal to regulate the flow of data was struck down in 2020. Now, pressure could be ramping up for a new deal on data sharing. I want to bring in CNBC's tech correspondent, Steve Kovac. Steve, good to see you here. Meta uh, is no stranger to fines from this particular data protection agency, right? The company says it's going to appeal this fine and the ruling here, but... Of the top five fines, Meta actually has four of them, with the only exception here being Amazon. So help us understand, this is a big fine we're talking about here. What's the end game here? What's, what's going to change? Yeah, Aaron, so it is a big fine, and I know a billion dollars sounds like a lot to you and me, but to Facebook or Meta, this is basically just a parking ticket. So it's actually, they're appealing this decision, not so much because they don't want to spend a billion dollars to settle everything. The data is what's really important to them. The data is far more valuable than any billions they could pay in fines, and their ability to be able to transfer that data from users in the EU over to the U.S. and back and forth helps them with their real business, and that's targeting and selling ads. So that's what this appeal is mostly going to be about. Not necessarily that they can't afford the, the $1 billion fine, but they want to be able to have that uh, control over their user data in order to better sell ads to, to their customers in the EU. Now, what's being discussed right now is a way to create that law for messages or data being passed in between um, the two uh, countries. Uh, they're still working that out. I know it was turned down in 2020, but there's uh, renewed talks to, to get that worked out. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, this new deal on data sharing. Like you said, it was announced last year, not in effect yet. It, what Help us understand, and I'm going to ask you to just sort of dumb it down for other, yeah. us who are not tech savvy. What's it supposed to do? Would it give Meta and these other big companies any real relief? Yeah, well, one of the concerns about this, Aaron, the reason why this GDPR law even has it in the, in, to begin with is there's a concern that when data gets transferred in between countries, particular to the U.S., there's a fear that maybe U.S. spy agencies can snoop into it and, and get that user data. Whether or not that's happening doesn't matter. There's a concern about it, and so, therefore, there's that regulation around it. One thing Facebook is asking for is, well, like, at least let us be able to, for certain data, such as if someone in the EU sends a message to someone in the the U.S., they would want to keep that okay. But this is still being worked out. It's going to take a long time to play. You know, I appreciate you, Steve. You always make it easy for me. I understood <laughs> Thanks, all that. So thank you. <laughs> appreciate you got it. it. That's my job. Yeah. Coming up, an organization, a historic organization, urging people not to travel to Florida. How that could impact the state's governor as he gets close to entering the race for the White House. Plus, you might have heard lawmakers call for President Biden to use the 14th Amendment as a fix for the debt ceiling crisis. We're gonna break down what that really means for all the non-constitutional scholars out there and in here, most of us. Stay with us. <laughs> Why doctors at one of New York City's oldest hospitals are trading scrubs for picket signs. That's in today's local. First though, the NAACP is putting out a warning for certain groups thinking about traveling to the state of Florida. The travel advisory coming after moves by Governor Ron DeSantis to restrict how topics like race and gender are talked about in the state's classrooms. The civil rights group says in a statement, Florida is, quote, openly hostile toward African-Americans, people of color and LGBTQ plus individuals and devalues and marginalizes the contributions of and the challenges faced by African-Americans and other communities of color. Now, you might remember DeSantis blocked an AP African-American Studies course back in January, ultimately leading the college board, which designed the course, to revise the curriculum. NBC's Matt Dixon is in Florida covering this for us today. Uh, Matt, how, how impactful is it to have the NAACP warning folks not to go to Florida? Sure. Well, it certainly sent off shockwaves and, and got a lot of attention nationally, and, and people are, are now talking and focusing on it. But it's important to note this is sort of another bullet point in sort of the, the culture war clashes that Florida has become the, the really the epicenter for under DeSantis. The NLACP is the most recent to do one of these sort of travel advisories, but the League of United Latin American Citizens has also done one. Equality Florida, which represents uh, LGBTQ uh, communities in the state of Florida, have also done one. So. This is sort of a, another step in organizations like that pushing back against Governor DeSantis's sort of, um, you know, policy portfolio and his legislative priorities as he leads up to ultimately running for president, which we, you know, expect him to formally roll out uh, uh, later this week. Well, let's talk more about that then. I mean, the, the reality on the ground for him, you've got this fight with Disney, which pulled thousands of jobs out of that state last week, the criticism from these civil rights groups, and, and then the constant attacks from the former president, who also lives in Florida, Donald Trump. I, I, yeah. Is all this complicating things for DeSantis as he starts to prepare for this launch of a presidential bid in any day now? Sure. Well, well, I think it's kind of instructive to think all these controversies in, in two different silos, of, you know, one the primary and one the general election. I think Governor DeSantis and his team sees a need to get through a primary, and I think all of these issues, the things you just mentioned, there was uh, the legislation this year that removed the need for folks here to, to have permits to carry firearms, a six-week abortion uh, a bill, the uh, a slate of four or five anti-trans bills. All of those, I, I think the governor's team thinks are culture wars that make a lot of sense in a primary sort of ecosystem. So whether whether that's going to play in a general election, if he can get there, is an entirely different story. But I think they at least anticipate Governor DeSantis being set up well to sort of get a lot of momentum and charge into the the, the Republican primary that, you know, we're, we're about to see that, that clash set up here in, a, you know, a few days. All right, Matt Dixon for us uh, covering DeSantis and all things Florida for us today. Matt, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, President Biden meeting with Speaker McCarthy right now on raising the debt ceiling. That's, that meeting should be getting underway. But if they cannot make a deal, can the president raise the debt ceiling himself without Congress? 
Well, some Democrats are asking Biden to consider that, invoking the 14th Amendment we're talking about here. It's never been done before. And even the Treasury Secretary wonders if it would actually work. Hallie takes a look at what you need to know in tonight's breakdown. Every day, the U.S. gets closer and closer to running out of cash to pay its bills. And if the president and congressional leaders can't get to a deal to get those debts paid, there's this really historic and pretty controversial move the president could make. I have been considering the 14th Amendment. The president referring to a 150-year-old amendment put into place right after the Civil War. It's not overall related to finance. Its intention was to protect people who were previously enslaved. But there's this section inside the 14th Amendment saying the validity of the public debt of the United States shall not be questioned. That's important because now some experts think that phrase gives the president the ability to go around Congress to pay the country's bills, even though typically it's Congress that has the power of the purse. I would hope that the president will take executive action if the House refuses to do its job. It's not a slam dunk. Far from it. It's legally questionable. Um, whether or not that's a viable strategy. No president has ever tried to use the 14th Amendment to prevent a debt default. In other words, to make sure the U.S. does pay its bills. The problem is it would have to be litigated. And experts agree, saying if the president does try this, it probably will get tied up in court. He's quite right that he would almost certainly be sued. And I think he is concerned that there would be uncertainty, that it would... Uh, unsettle the markets. But President Biden has made one thing clear. Default is not an option. We will not default. Now, President Biden also said yesterday that he does believe he has the authority to use the 14th Amendment, but time will tell if he ends up actually trying that. Our thanks to Hallie Jackson for that explanation. Up next, alarming new research about women's heart health. What can be done to boost the chances of surviving a heart attack? New research showing that women are more than twice as likely to die after a heart attack than men. Researchers at the European Society of Cardiology looked at records of 844 patients. They found that 30 days after a heart attack, almost 12% of women had died compared to almost 5% of men. And five years after a heart attack, 32% of women had died versus 17% of men. Researchers say the findings indicate a need for more research to close the gender gap when it comes to survival after a heart attack. Dr. Bio Curry Winchell joins us now to help us understand uh, what's going on here. So, Doc, another study actually found that the diagnosis of heart failure is usually missed more often in women than in men. Help us understand why is the diagnosis and treatment of, of heart problems more, I guess, ad adversely affecting women? Well, this has unfortunately been happening for a long time. Often when we look at the traditional or classic types of symptoms with chest pain, we think of chest pain, arm pain. However, that is often associated with men. However, with women, there are unique symptoms such as fatigue, flu-like symptoms. And so often they're just misdiagnosed or correlated to something else. And that's, you know, something that we have to continue to talk about because, as you mentioned, it's really costing lives every day. So what, what sort of treatments or preventions are the authors of this study recommending for women after a heart attack? So the important piece is to really not ignore those subtle symptoms, such as discomfort or anything that is not at your baseline. And so this study really highlights the importance of going in and seeing your doctor, as well as not allowing those symptoms that are often associated with either menopause or other factors to go ignored. So this study highlights that we have to be mindful and really look at the symptoms associated with heart disease and their effects for women. Yeah, you have to pay attention to the warning signs. Dr. Bio Curry Winchell, we appreciate your expertise and sharing with us today. Thank you so much. Well, NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to all of them, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going on in their regions in a segment we call The Local from our Midwest Bureau. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer just signed that state's new red flag gun law aimed at keeping guns away from people found to be a danger to themselves or others. 
The new law will let family members, mental health professionals, roommates, and former partners ask a judge to temporarily take away someone's guns if that person is deemed a risk. The law is supposed to go into effect next spring. Out of our Northeast Bureau, more than 150 resident doctors on strike today at a local hospital. This is in Queens, New York. This is the first physician strike at a hospital in New York City in more than 30 years. They're demanding better pay and benefits, claiming that they make less than their equals at hospitals in Manhattan. The strike is expected to last five days. And out of our Southern Bureau, a police officer in Clearwater, Florida, single-handedly capturing a snake at a business early this morning. Look at this. You can see her slowly prying that five-foot-long red-tailed boa out of the bars of a window there. She took it to a local vet. In the department's Facebook post, the officer said if it had been a spider, she would have been out. She's okay with snakes, though. I'm totally with her on that. Spiders or no. Snakes I can handle. No big deal. Stay with us. Still ahead, Uber's new feature allowing teenagers to ride solo. Details on all the safety steps taken to put parents' minds at ease. Today, teenagers will be able to order their own Ubers. The rideshare service rolling out its new teen feature in about a dozen U.S. cities. It lets 13 to 17-year-olds request Ubers linked to their parents' accounts. And Uber says it includes a bunch of safety features. Parents can track their kids' trips live. There's pin verification before teens can ride. Uber's ride check system detects off-course trips, too. There's audio recording available. Parents can contact the driver during the trip. And Uber reps say only experienced, highly rated drivers are selected for these teen rides. Let's bring in Maggie Vespa now, who's been looking into this for us. So, Maggie, to start here, let's be real. Even Uber knows that teens are already riding in Ubers by themselves, right? Yes. How is this, this feature change going to be different? What's it going to make uh, different for these kids, for these families? And is it safe? So, so to that last question, Uber says it is. You'll hear more on that in a second. But you laid out some of the sort of safety um, parameters that they've put in place to try and make it so. But first, you know, just to kind of that reality. And I know your team in the studio um, and our team here in the Midwest, you know, you guys were talking about this. Yeah, like teens have been using Uber. That's kind of a... Uh, poorly kept secret, basically. And the company says the drivers have been reporting that for a really long time, that essentially an adult, or at least an adult's account, will order an Uber, and then here walks this, like, 14-year-old kid <laughs> getting into the car by themselves, putting the driver in a really uncomfortable position because the driver says, okay, do I violate policy and take this unaccompanied minor, or do I leave said unaccompanied minor where they are basically stranded and then not knowing what could happen to them in that capacity. So they basically said, let's figure out a way, given kind of all the commitments that parents have, they have to drive their kids around to school, to practice, to activities. Let's give them a way to help them get kids from point A to point B via Uber safely. So here comes this new kind of part of the family app. The kids are added via their parents' account. And basically Uber says that they will uh, they have those safety parameters in place and on the most experienced well-rated drivers they say will be allowed to pick up those teens and drive them to and fro aaron all right maggie vespa thank you for that maggie thank you right now we want to go to some breaking news talks on the debt ceiling just getting underway at the white house uh, we know that uh, the president and the speaker of the house kevin mccarthy are uh are together here, and I think, can we listen in a little bit? Uh, this is right before they're about to start their their business meeting on the debt ceiling. Uh, I think, can we listen? $1.7 trillion in matters, and so I'm all for reducing and continuing to reduce the deficit. And, uh, but we all, we both talked about the need for a bipartisan agreement. We have to be in a position where we can sell it to our constituencies. We're pretty well divided in the House, almost down the middle. And it's not any different in the Senate. So we got to get something that can sell to both sides. And uh, we need to cut spending, but we uh, here's a disagreement. We have to, I think we should be looking at tax loopholes and uh, make sure the wealthy pay their fair share. I think revenue matters, as well as uh, as long as you're not taxing anybody under 400,000 bucks. And uh, so we're going to, we still have some disagreements, but I think we may be able to get where we have to go. We both know we have a significant responsibility. With that, I'm going to turn it over to the speaker. Kevin, it's all yours. Well, I thank the president for spending time. We had a very productive conversation yesterday, even though he was coming back from the G7 meeting. Um, I, 
we do have disagreements. I think we have, of a 50-year average, we're having more revenue at any time coming in. But I think we both agree that we need to change the trajectory, uh, that our debt is too large. And I think at the end of the day, we could find common ground, make our economy stronger, take care of this debt, but more importantly, get this government moving again to curb inflation, make us less dependent upon China, and uh, make our appropriation system work when we get done, right? I'm all for making appropriations work. <laughs> now that I'm either to do it. Mr. President, is overall spending the way to resolve All right, this is uh, the part of the program where the reporters try to ask questions and the staff at the White House try to get them out of the room uh, so that the president and the speaker can actually begin their conversations. Obviously, them both noting that uh, they are far apart on some things, but they are hopeful about being, being able to come to some uh, consensus on uh, the debt ceiling. I think we'll take a break here. More news on NBC News Now right after this. We have breaking news as we come on the air, because as we speak, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy are behind closed doors looking for a way to stop the global economy from going into chaos. What we expect out of these talks happening right now. Also tonight, why is the man accused of killing four University of Idaho students refusing to say whether he's guilty in court? More on what we saw but did not hear from Brian Koberger today. Plus, the first interview with Senator Tim Scott as he throws his hat into the Republican race for the White House. Why he's telling our Tom Yamas he is the guy for the job. Then, a new deal for states out west to keep the water flowing and keep the Biden administration out. But is it enough to save the shrinking Colorado River? And new details on a lawsuit filed by TikTok hitting back at Montana and its ban on that popular app. Why the company says the state is violating its First Amendment rights. That's later in the show. Hi, everybody. I'm Aaron Gilchrist in for Halley, and we have breaking news tonight. Right now, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy going head to head in the Oval Office. Will they come out with a debt limit deal that could stop a global economic catastrophe in about 10 days? You see the president and speaker right there in just the last few minutes. We expect that the speaker will give us an update once this meeting is over, all in an effort to make sure the U.S. can pay its bills. And in the last hour or so, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen out with a new letter to congressional leaders reminding them that the U.S. is going to run out of cash as early as June 1 if they don't take action. And right now, the lines of communication, they've been a bit frayed. You can see White House negotiators at the Capitol earlier today. That meeting broke up about three hours after it started. The speaker saying earlier, there is more work to be done. Decisions have to start being made. I mean, they're 10 days out. Has Let's get right to uh, Washington here. Monica Alba at the White House for us. Garrett Hake on Capitol Hill today. Let's start with the president's view on things. Monica, as we understand it so far, what are we hearing from the president uh, in just the last couple of minutes here? Well, he did just say, Aaron, that he does continue to feel that a deal can be reached at some point, whether it's really going to be hashed out in the next hour or so in this face to face, I think is unlikely. But I think if they can kind of at least agree to merge on a couple of areas of cooperation that can answer some of the major questions that both of their parties have, then the White House will see that as at least limited progress that will build on what they were already calling some productive movement in the last 24 hours or so when they did narrow the conversations down to just the president and the Republican Speaker of the House. That phone call from Air Force One last night laying the groundwork for now this ability to hash some of this out in person, though they did just talk briefly in that spring about some major areas of disagreement that remain when it comes to specifically revenue and spending cuts. So I think they're going to talk about both of those things. But I'm told by a White House official that 
what they call reasonable compromise can still be accomplished here and that what neither of these leaders wants to see happen is for America to default for the first time ever in its history. So they can kind of agree on that and put that to the side, but everything else that comes along with it, they still don't completely agree on. And so I think you're right that Speaker McCarthy is set to talk after this uh, meeting here. Will we also hear from the president? That's a big question mark that I have because he's going to want to come out and probably give his accounting of how this went as well. And if those two things are still miles apart and completely divergent, then we'll really have an issue. If you can start to see sort of the outlines or a framework emerge here, then I think the negotiators go back to working at this, potentially even tonight, likely tomorrow, to hash out some of the remaining big picture items. The big picture items you mentioned here, uh, Monica, I want to sort of lay this out for folks who are watching to be able to see this on their screens. We'll put up a graphic here to, to look at some of them. We know the big one, right? The debt limit, obviously, we're talking about that. But then there's also questions on spending caps, on work requirements for government programs, uh, raising new revenue streams. The president sort of referenced that in his comments a few minutes ago. And then the literal length of time of whatever deal they ultimately come up with. Where does the White House stand on all of that? Right. Is this going to be a two-year deal? Or are we going to be talking about something shorter than that, where we're going to be right back in this place where we find ourselves negotiating all of this all over again? You mentioned revenue streams, Aaron, and that is significant because for as long as he's been president, Joe Biden has said the way he wants to raise revenue is by taxing the wealthiest Americans and corporations. Now, that's something that's pretty much a non-starter for Republicans. So, of course, he's going to come out and say that that's one of his priorities. Is that something that ultimately is going to be the only way to continue to reduce the deficit, which is another goal that Republicans and Democrats share. But they really can't agree, really, on how to go about doing it. That's a big other area that we're going to see where they both come down. But I think you also saw Speaker McCarthy there even hint at this, saying, yeah, we disagree on a lot still, but they both, I think, want to avoid plunging America into a recession and seeing millions of people potentially losing their jobs. Aaron. Absolutely. Monica Alba for us outside the White House today. Monica, thank you. Let's head to the other end of the National Mall. Garrett Hake on Capitol Hill for us now. So, Garrett, same question here, but from the Republican perspective, if you will, because we also just heard uh, Speaker McCarthy talk about the debt being too large, wanting to make the economy stronger. How far apart are, are Republicans and the White House from the Republican perspective? I think they're significantly far apart still, Aaron, and hearing those remarks from the speaker, very similar to the kinds of things he's been saying on Capitol Hill for the last two weeks or so. I'm, I'm struck by the fact that it seems like these two men have taken turns uh, calling each other's bluff. I mean, first McCarthy calling the president's bluff that he wouldn't negotiate on the debt limit. Now you see the president essentially trying to call McCarthy's bluff on default and on how they avoid it. McCarthy has been pretty clear that he wants to see spending levels ultimately go down year over year, that we spend less money in 2024 than we did in 2023. And how they get there, in McCarthy's view, is on cuts alone. But you heard from the president, uh, asked a question by our own Kelly O'Donnell as the reporters were being ushered out of the room there about, you know, cutting your way to a deal here. And the president said, not cuts alone, not cuts alone. It's clear that the White House wants to call McCarthy's bluff, that if you're serious about limiting the debt, you have to close some of these tax loopholes and try to bring in some revenue in ways that might be creative enough to get around Republican votes uh, uh, typically against tax increases, but by closing loopholes. It's going to take a lot of, you know, verbal jujitsu, I think, to get uh, both sides to a position where they can say yes to things that run contrary to their traditional interests, Aaron. And I'm not sure that one meeting at the White House tonight is going to get us there. So, so what are we expecting from Speaker McCarthy then when he does come out to, to speak at some point this evening, whether it's outside the White House or back there on the Hill? Well, I think he'll probably do both, Aaron. McCarthy's press strategy on this front has been pretty clear. He is talking to everyone, everywhere, all at once. Every opportunity has gotten to get in front of cameras to kind of reiterate the House Republican position he has taken. And I think he feels like that's boxed in the White House to a certain degree, and that he and House Republicans have been able to drive some of the national conversation on this issue. So I do think we'll hear from him at least once, if not twice, uh, trying to outline in his view whatever the parameters are of this deal. Frankly, I am very curious to see if President Biden decides to respond or not, because, you know, kind of how the American public goes on about thinking about who might be at fault here if we do not uh, come up with a deal, I think will drive kind of who feels the most pressure to cave in the next uh, 10 or 12 days. All right. Garrett Hague for us on the Hill tonight. Garrett, thank you.
Let's take you out to Idaho now with the man accused of stabbing and killing four University of Idaho students in court today for the first time since a grand jury indicted him. Take a look at this. Brian Koberger staying silent during his court appearance today, leading the judge there to enter not guilty pleas for the four murder charges he's facing. It's now been six months since the shocking killings and manhunt that gripped the country. This comes as NBC's Dateline exclusively, exclusively reporting detectives found evidence that Koberger went on Amazon to buy a K-bar knife and sheath, according to a source with inside knowledge of the investigation. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin is following all of this from outside the courthouse there in Idaho and joins us now. So, Aaron, uh, what are we seeing? What did we see in the courtroom today? Why is Koberger staying silent here? What do we know about what happens next? Hey, Aaron. Well, today's court proceeding lasted some 15 minutes. It was a sort of business as usual arraignment hearing. Koberger was asked a series of questions by the judge. He was asked if he had a copy of the indictment that was handed down by a secret grand jury last week. He said yes. He was asked if he understood all five charges against him. He said yes. He was asked to enter a plea, and as you say, he, he stood silent, his lawyer making it clear that they would not be entering a plea at this time, that they would be standing in silence, which uh, in return, the judge then entering a not guilty plea on his behalf. Now, legal experts say that on the face of it, there are no real tactical advantages to standing silent. But what it does do is buy the defense time to take another look at those documents from the grand jury proceedings, which were held by the prosecution in secret. They'll have time to review that. But it also keeps things moving. A series of dates have now been set. The judge today setting the trial date for October 2nd, a trial that is expected to last some six weeks also. It gives uh, the prosecution 60 days with which to file a motion to pursue the death penalty, which legal experts I've been talking to say they expect to happen, Aaron. You know, I want to ask you more about this exclusive reporting from Dateline, too, Aaron. Uh, this is about that K-bar knife and the sheet that Ko Koberger allegedly bought. What more do we know about that? Yeah, according to a source with knowledge of the investigation telling Dateline NBC that authorities believe Brian Koberger bought a K-bar knife and sheath on Amazon uh, in the months prior to the murders. And that's potentially significant because authorities say they believe that a K-bar knife was used to carry out the attacks, a sheath with Brian Koberger's DNA, they allege, was found at the murder scene. No murder weapon has been found at this point, Aaron. Aaron McLaughlin for us in Idaho tonight. Aaron, thank you. South Carolina Senator Tim Scott tonight speaking to NBC News just hours after kicking off his 2024 presidential campaign. He's also starting off a week that could see more big names jump into the race. Scott telling NBC's Tom Yamas the kind of candidate he's going to be. Do you think GOP voters want someone carrying a Bible or do they want someone driving a bulldozer into the Democrats? What people really want is an optimistic, positive, conservative who has a backbone, but also believes that the best is yet to come. Scott is the only black Republican senator, and he's now joining three other candidates who've held elected office, including the former president and frontrunner Donald Trump. We are also getting the announcement just days before Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is expected to jump into the race, too, considered to be the biggest threat to Mr. Trump's chances at taking the nomination for a third time in a row. NBC's Ali Vitale joining me now from North Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, Ali, talk to us about the Scott game plan here to get people to talk more about him, to support him, and not focus so much on Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis. Well, look, the focus is going to be on Trump and DeSantis regardless, Aaron. But when it comes to Tim Scott, he's playing a game of being on the ground in all of these key states that he wants to focus on, specifically Iowa, New Hampshire, and, of course, his home state of South Carolina. But he's also getting some air cover in doing that. The fact that his senior officials can come out of the gate touting the fact that he's got a deep war chest to the tune of more than $20 million already allows them to get on the air a lot earlier than a lot of other campaigns would otherwise be able to.
It's why we're watching them go up on the airwaves in Iowa and New Hampshire specifically with $6 million worth of an ad buy that's on TV and radio. They've also got an additional seven-figure ad buy that's going to be on digital. It's more than most campaigns can do at the immediate outset, in large part because most campaigns have to do fundraising in order to get the money to get them on the air. The fact that Tim Scott is able to come in with this deep of a war chest is something that's going to help him not just in the immediate term, but also in making the long slog through the summer, through the winter, getting through all of those debates and just being able to stay in long enough that voters have the chance to actually vote for him in a field of other candidates. This is the message, though, that Scott advisors tell me they think will differentiate him without having him do active contrast or attack. Watch. We, we need a president that persuades. We have to do that with common sense, conservative principles. But we have to have a compassion for people. We have to have a compassion for people who don't agree with us. Now, I think what's going to be fascinating, Aaron, is, yes, Tim Scott is bringing a message of what he's trying to be compassionate conservatism, talking with an optimistic tone about what could happen in the future. But at the same time, he's also offering a pretty dark picture of what Repub of what Democrats rather are doing to this country and the way that he sees people like President Joe Biden as someone who he is staunchly against. We watched him draw contrast again, not with the other Republicans in the field, but putting himself already on a binary between Biden and the current White House and he, Tim Scott, as the man who he says is going to be the next commander in chief. Well, you know, the, the, the former president seems to be sort of welcoming Scott into this this fray of Republicans, right? Yeah. He's posted on Truth Social, wishing him luck in the race. Uh, at the same time, in the same breath, they're going after his likely top rival in Ron DeSantis, calling him totally unelectable again. Uh, in sort of a weird way, yeah. Ali, does this hurt a candidacy to not be seen as a threat, to not be attacked by the guys who th who's at the front of the pack? I don't think so, especially because if you're the guy who's drawing Trump's ire, that is now all your energy and all of your strategy. Mm. For Tim Scott, his strategy is not Trump-centric. In fact, right now, I think he's preferring to ignore the fact that the former president even exists because he's trying to introduce himself to the American public. The fact that Tim Scott is coming in, polling between 1% and 3% means he has a lot of work to do. It doesn't help to go on the attack if you're trying to introduce yourself to voters as someone who has a lot of policies that are kind of in parallel with Donald Trump. So instead, Scott's going to continue to play his own game, kind of row in his own race. And I think, based on conversations I've had with sources both in the Scott camp and just in the Republican apparatus writ large, they're happy for Donald Trump to take care of Ron DeSantis, and then the rest of the field can sort of play in the space that's made there. All right. Ali Vitale for us in South Carolina tonight. Ali, thank you. And you can watch more of Tom Yamas' exclusive interview with Senator Scott tonight here on NBC News Now on Top Story. That's at 7 p.m. Eastern. Well, states that rely on the Colorado River for water reached a crucial deal today to cut back on water usage. Now, under the proposed plan, three of those states, Arizona, California, Nevada, they will all conserve at least 3 million acre feet of water by 2026. Now, that's about how much water it takes to fill 6 million Olympic-sized pools. President Biden, in a statement calling that deal an important step in our efforts to protect the stability of the Colorado River system. And it's important to point out just how vital the Colorado River really is. It supplies drinking water to 40 million people. That's across seven states. It also irrigates 5.5 million acres of farmland and provides power through electricity generated by dams on the river's reservoirs. Now, this new deal should avoid the federal government from taking matters into its own hands. Just last month, the Biden administration proposed some steps that it would take if the states didn't reach a deal on their own. One of those was splitting water cuts evenly across those states. Let's bring in Dana Griffin now in our Los Angeles bureau tonight. So, Dana, what happens next now that this deal is, is actually on the table? Well, it kind of puts a dent in conservation of the of the water that we get from the Colorado River. This also, like you mentioned, staves off the government from having to step in and actually make a deal itself and say, well, this is how much you're going to, to save and this is how much we're going to cut. It also incentivizes these three states because according to this deal, it calls for the federal, federal government to pay about $1.2 billion to irrigation districts, cities, and Native American tribes in these three states if they temporarily 
use less water. And these states have also agreed to cut back even more. And we know that the Interior Department is now going to take a closer look at this proposal before it decides what to do next. Aaron. Can you talk a little bit more, Dana, about the, the sort of impacts, the real world impacts this could have on these states' water supplies? And is, is this actually going to be enough to, to make things better? Well, it's a, it's a step in the right direction, but Aaron, as you mentioned, it is not enough. Let's go back here. So the government initially wanted two to four million acre feet of water conserved each year. And over this three year span, they're only conserving about three million. And it's, a, it's important. It's a, it's a good step because the thing that has helped them to not have to, you know, take more drastic steps at this point is because we had a very abundant rainy winter season, which has helped to replenish some of those reservoirs. But we are not out of the woods yet. And actually discussions on what we can do uh, once 2026 hits and beyond that those discussions start in a month. So it just goes to show that this is just a temporary fix. And when it comes to what can happen, I know here in California, the governor before has issued um, requirements for people to conserve water, whether you can't use sprinklers to water your lawn to help conserve that water. So it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next several months as these states implement changes. So as a whole, we can help conserve water here out in the West. Aaron. Step in the right direction, by no means the end of the story, though. Dana Griffin for us tonight. Dana, thank you. Ukrainian forces tonight saying they are making progress by surrounding Russian troops in the key eastern city of Bakhmut. Now, this comes after Moscow declared it had captured Bakhmut over the weekend, uh, gaining control of that city, full control, they said. Russian state media calling it a liberation. President Vladimir Putin promising state rewards to those who distinguish themselves in the war's longest and bloodiest battle. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who spent the weekend rallying support from world leaders at the G7 summit in Japan, had this to say when asked if the city was, in fact, under Russian control. I think no. But you have to, to understand that there is nothing. They destroyed everything. Bakhmut is only in our hearts. So just drowned and, and a lot of dead Russians. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us now. Raf, the Russians are seeing this as a symbolic boost for President Putin, right, in his first really major victory on the battlefield in about a year. The Ukrainians, though, say that this is actually not the case, that they're making progress in pushing the Russians out. Can you help us understand these sort of conflicting views? Yeah, Aaron, a lot of fog of war right now. We don't know exactly who controls which street in Bakhmut, but it is clear that the Russians are in control of the vast majority of the city at this point, or what's left of the city, because as President Zelensky said, the Russians have almost completely destroyed this city in the process of mounting their so-called liberation. Rewinding to Saturday, Evgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner mercenary group, whose troops have really been the tip of the spear, in terms of fighting for the Russian side in Bakhmut. He says that they have taken full control of the city. A day later, Vladimir Putin chimes in. He says this is a great victory for the Russian people. Interestingly, Bakhmut has seen real tension between the Wagner mercenaries and the regular Russian army. And Prigozhin is now saying that his troops, having taken the city, are going to leave as early as Thursday and hand it over to the regular Russian military. Take listen to a little bit of what he had to say. There are lines of defense on the western outskirts now. Therefore, PMC Wagner is going to leave Artumovsk from May 25th to June 1st. Now, from the Ukrainian side, they say they are still fighting on the outskirts of the city. They are trying to flank the Russians from the north and the south. We will see how well that works. But, Aaron, it is worth remembering, Bakhmut was always more symbolic than it was strategic. And from the Ukrainian perspective, even if they have been pushed out of the city, they really feel like they achieved something here because they bogged down the Russian forces for a very long time. And they say they killed a whole lot more Russians than they lost. Nobody knows exactly how many troops were killed on either side. But one Ukrainian official said to me when I was in the country a few months ago that they believed they were killing seven Russian soldiers for every one Ukrainian they lost in Bakhmut.
Aaron. You know, Raf, we have less than a minute here, but I do want to ask you, Z Zelensky is getting more support from the G7. We, you know he was there this weekend. President Biden committing to sending those F-16 fighter jets. Germany announcing a big military aid package for Ukraine last week. How big of an impact is all this making or going to make at this point? I think going to make is the key phrase. A lot of this stuff has still not reached the battlefield, right? Just taking the F-16s, there is now an agreement that the NATO allies will train Ukrainian pilots and will eventually provide F-16s, but we don't know how long that's going to take. We don't know who is providing those F-16s. The big test, Aaron, will be when this long-awaited Ukrainian counteroffensive begins. We will see how effectively the Ukrainians are able to put the new equipment that they all already have in their arsenal to use. And so that is what Western capitals are watching right now. Aaron. Right. Raf Sanchez for us overseas today. Raf, thank you. And coming up for the first time in years, there's going to be a new search for Madeleine McCann, that British toddler who disappeared on vacation with her family. We'll tell you why Portuguese police say they, what, why, they, why they say they're doing it now. Plus, Miley Cyrus says she is not planning to go on tour anymore. We'll tell you why coming up in our five things. New tonight, TikTok is suing Montana after the state passed a law last week to ban the app. Now, the company says what Montana is doing is unconstitutional and violates the First Amendment to, of everyone who uses the app. The state's governor signed that ban just last week, a first in this country, making it illegal for app stores to give people the option to download TikTok. Just in the last hour, the Montana Attorney General's office responded to the lawsuit saying it expected legal challenges and is prepared to defend Montana's privacy and security. Now, the ban is supposed to go into effect on January 1st of next year, and it's already raising concerns about how the law would be enforced. App Store operators like Apple and Google, who violate the ban, would face a $10,000 fine. Our legal analyst, Danny Savalos, is joining me now. So, Danny, it's not just the First Amendment the company is using to cite concerns here. TikTok also says that uh, this violates things like the Commerce Clause, and it preempts federal law. Help us understand the argument here. Yeah, it is preempted by federal law is the argument. And after the First Amendment argument, probably preemption is the strongest argument here. And that's basically the, the idea that if Montana is essentially enacting its own foreign policy by uh, passing legislation that targets China, then the complaint argues that they are engaging in foreign policy and states just can't do that, no more than they can print their own currency. But I expect Montana's response is going to be something to the effect of, well, look, I mean, this isn't about foreign policy. What if we just don't think it's good for Montanans? What if we think it damages our youth? So that might be a short-term win if they can get it thrown out on preemption grounds, because then Montana could just go back and say, well, now we think it's unhealthy for our youth, and we're going to pass it for that reason, not because we're engaging in foreign policy. Now, the Commerce Clause argument is interesting to me, because any, any state law that burdens interstate commerce could mm -hmm. potentially be struck uh, by the court, because that's an unconstitutional thing to do. You know, state lawmakers have, have argued that this ban is supposed to protect people's personal data from the Chinese government, as you alluded to there. TikTok says in the lawsuit that that is unfounded speculation, I think is the term they use. Do you think the company, uh, the, the case stands a chance here in, in, the, in the long run? Well, that argument there is important to TikTok's claims, but it's almost not even essential, because the point is, if Montana is violating the First Amendment or it's passing legislation that is preempted by federal law, preempted by the constitutional mandate that only the federal government handles things like foreign policy, then it doesn't really matter how healthy TikTok is or mm. whether or not it's damaging or whether or not it is actually uh, handing over data to the Chinese government. Uh, that is really in my mind, a secondary uh, issue to the underall, overall argument, which is that the, the very nature of Montana's ban is itself unconstitutional for a number of reasons. And really what TikTok, in fact, does uh, may be of lesser importance than what Montana may, may be doing that is overreaching its powers under the federal constitution. It is going to be interesting to see this work through the courts, for sure. Danny Savalas with us tonight. Danny, thanks. 
Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Nebraska's Republican governor just signed a bill that bans abortions at 12 weeks, effective immediately. It's also going to restrict gender-affirming care for people under 19 years old starting October 1st. Opponents are promising to sue to try and block the new restrictions. Number two, police in Portugal are restarting the search for Madeleine McCann, the British toddler who went missing while on vacation. That was back in 2007. Crews are going to be looking around a reservoir about 30 miles from where the then three-year-old was last seen. A search like this happened back in 2014 as well. This new effort is being requested by German authorities. A German citizen charged in other crimes has been identified as a suspect in this mystery. He has denied any involvement. Number three, a new study suggesting a new weight loss drug made by Pfizer may be as effective as that hugely popular drug Ozempic. Pfizer says its version can be taken as a pill instead of an injection. The results found that patients who took the drug lost an average of 10 pounds over four months. Number four, the Consumer Product Safety Commission recalling nearly half a million waffle makers. They say that the Power XL Stuff Waffleizer can push out pieces of hot food which can burn somebody. The safety agency says it's received 34 reports of burns. Three of them needed medical attention. You can contact the company for a free repair. And number five, pop star Miley Cyrus says she is done touring. The former Disney star telling British Vogue she hasn't had a desire to do a major tour since her last arena tour. That was nearly 10 years ago. The 30-year-old also cited safety concerns. Cyrus says she still loves playing for friends and family and in more intimate settings. Well, a private mission to space making history today when four astronauts, including three paying customers, docked at the International Space Station. Take a look. You can see here the crew on the private flight by SpaceX and Axiom docking with the ISS and meeting the astronauts who were already on board there. The flight crew includes two American and two Saudi Arabian astronauts and, and really a bunch of firsts here, too. The first Saudi woman to visit the space station. The first time a female astronaut has commanded a private space mission. And then take a look at this. It's the first time SpaceX landed a Falcon 9 booster back near the launch site. This is eight minutes after takeoff here. Instead of having to land on a barge out in the ocean... Now, the astronauts are going to be doing some research and some experiments during this eight-day visit to the International Space Station. Marissa Parra joins us now from Florida. Marissa, talk to us about how big a step this is in that journey toward commercialized space flight, making space flight really more widely accessible. Yeah, well, this one launch is part of a bigger effort to one day eventually make life multiplanetary. So Axiom wants to be the face of the very first commercial space station. They want to build a business park in space, if you will. Um, and remember, they have an agreement with NASA to eventually, by sometime late 2025, build a commercially owned module attached to the International Space Station. So that's just about two years from now that they're setting that goal for. Axiom has another launch planned for later this very year. So, Aaron, the space race is more than on. Yeah, full speed ahead for sure, right? Uh, talk to us a little bit about the crew here, uh, Marissa. What do we know about the folks that, that made the trip and, and what it cost them to make this private trip? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, we'll start with the crew themselves first. Uh, four in total, two Americans, two Saudis, and Peggy Whitson is probably one of the most decorated former astronauts with NASA. You can see her on the far left there. She actually holds a record for the most amount of days spent in space before this mission, 665. Now, everyone else that you see on the screen there, this is their very first time in space, and it was really special to watch them mark their first moments in zero gravity. So we actually got a chance to listen to what they had to say in their first moments in the International Space Station. And what we saw and what we found is that excitement extends not just to the newbies, but even the veteran astronaut herself. We really are excited to be here. Uh, it was a great launch, a great ride. We had a lot of fun on the way up. And uh, we're really excited to get a lot of work done up here. But it's, it's, uh, it's great for me to come back personally. It does feel like home. I'm very happy to be here representing uh, the dreams and hopes of everyone back home. 
So that was Rana Bernawi, and as we talked about, her first time in space, she is the first Saudi woman on the International Space Station. And when we talk about uh, how these other three were able to make it to space, so we know that for um, Ali Al Karni and Bernawi, uh, the two Saudi astronauts, they were funded, sponsored by the Saudi government. John Schaffner, um, he's a businessman and aviator himself. He was able to fund himself. But the cost, that's the big question, Aaron. Here's the thing. Axiom doesn't technically have to tell us this is a private mission. But if you look at the cost of the last launch, that last mission, it was $55 million. So that should give you an idea of how expensive this kind of trip is to either fund yourself or get yourself there. But hey, if you've got $55 million laying around and maybe some aviation expense, uh, maybe, maybe some experience uh, <laughs> flying planes, then maybe you too can get to space. And by that's the collective you, not me, but anyway, <laughs> the other yous out there, right, for sure. Yes. Marissa Parra for us in Florida on the coast there today. Marissa, thanks. We want to stay on the topic of space for a moment here. NBC's Tom Costello has a new special report on how NASA is responding to the challenge of reaching Mars before China does. And they're doing it by reviving an old program from the 60s. Now, it explores how rockets powered by a nuclear reactor might be our ticket to getting to Mars faster and setting up a human presence there in the next few decades. I want you to hear a little bit about how these rockets are being built. So what is this here? This is, this is a nuclear test chamber. This is where they put components of nuclear thermal rockets, such as this fuel element here, and like the one that you're holding. These are the building blocks for America's future nuclear propulsion going to space. Yes. DARPA program manager Dr. Tabitha Dawson has pulled out the old blueprints and dusted off the test engines from the 1960s. And you can catch the full Meet the Press Reports special, Race to Mars, on demand now on Peacock and on YouTube. When we come back, why one of the country's top civil rights groups is warning people, certain groups of people, don't travel to Florida. Today, teenagers will be able to order their own Ubers. The rideshare service rolling out its new teen feature in about a dozen U.S. cities. It lets 13 to 17 year olds request Ubers linked to their parents' accounts. And Uber says it includes a bunch of safety features. Parents can track their kids' trips live. There's pin notification before teens can ride. Uber's ride check system detects off-course trips, too. There's also audio recording that's available. Parents can contact the driver during the trip. And Uber reps say only experienced, highly rated drivers are selected for these teen rides. So let's bring in Maggie Vespa now, who's been looking into this and joins us from our Chicago newsroom. So Maggie, to start, let's be honest here. Even Uber knows that teens are already using Uber themselves at this point, right? Yes. How, how will this feature change <laughs> things and is, is it safe? So Uber says it's safe, definitely. You'll hear more on that here in a second. But I mean, first to that reality that, yeah, no one denies. Uber said, we know this is happening. For years, they say drivers have been reporting that adults, adult accounts will order rides and then the driver pulls up and here comes this clearly very young kid, like a young teenager, getting in the car by themselves. That's against Uber policy. You're not supposed to ride alone if you're under 18. And the driver kind of wonders, OK, so do I violate policy and take this kid who wants this ride? Or do I leave said kid in this location by themselves? And it's a tough dilemma. So now via this new feature, the parent or the adult can add the child, add the kid as young as 13 years old onto their account. The kid orders the ride. The parent gets a notification and the parent can kind of follow the ride along with all those checks that you mentioned. Of course, that being said, we've covered this in the past. There are always safety headlines, safety questions when it comes to ride share. Uh, passengers have reported assaults, as have drivers. Again, this has been well covered. So with that in mind, I had this question for Uber earlier today. Take a listen. What do you say to parents who say when they think of ride share and safety issues, they think of coverage that they've read about assaults. We have taken a very safety-minded approach to this. The parent account controls the teen account, uh, and they have full visibility. So basically that rep for Uber also adding, he said, this is a high bar. And he noted he has a 14-year-old daughter. I said, would you be comfortable with your daughter then signing up and using this 
getting a random driver assigned through the system. And he said, absolutely, we plan to let my daughter use this because she has so many activities and school outings. And he also added, Aaron, they do run criminal background checks on all of these drivers. Again, noting that only the longest standing and best rated Uber drivers will be allowed to drive teens under this new feature, which launched today. So we'll be watching how that operates, Aaron. Well, you sort of noted it there about this parent obviously having a need for this sort of a service. The company says that there's yes. a real need for this too, right? The company does. And in fact, that rep we talked to, he said, my wife and I sit down and parent, you know, parents know this reality. So we mm -hmm. sit down every weekend and we spend a good chunk of it planning where who's going to drive, which kid where, like what practices there are, who's going to get the kids to school. And he said this could help alleviate a lot of that pressure, even with some of these questions and some of these concerns that parents may have as they learn about this new feature. So we went out and we asked some parents and kind of this is this is pretty much in line with a lot of what we heard. Take a listen. I think it's going to save a step for mom and dad. Um, obviously, parents need to have a talk with their kids, right, to make sure that they're not like taking Uber left, right and center. But like, I think it's probably a pretty good idea. Yeah, so basically parents sort of cautiously optimistic, they're open to it, but that said, I'm bringing back up the map. We wanna show you this again of where this is being launched. Notice these cities, like we're talking about New York and surrounding suburbs. We're talking about other major metropolitan areas like Atlanta, Georgia. We're also talking about like Kansas City, Missouri and Tucson, Arizona. Uh, the latter of which, Tucson, Arizona, you know, I lived there. We've all been to these, you know, to kind of different parts of the country. This is a variety and it includes areas like Tucson, like Kansas City, where it's rural. Kids need to get mm -hmm. places without public transit. So Uber says it's aware of these needs in all kinds of sort of parts of the country, all corners of the country. And they're trying to accommodate that as best they can, as safely as they can. Again, Aaron, we will be watching, as you know. Yeah, hope it works out well for these families, for sure. Maggie Vespa for us. Thank you, Maggie. Coming up, charcoal is being dumped into Rome's most famous fountain. We'll tell you why. That's later in The Global. The NAACP putting out a warning for certain groups thinking about traveling to the state of Florida. That travel advisory coming after moves by Governor Ron DeSantis to restrict how topics like race and gender are talked about in the state's classrooms. The civil rights group saying in a statement, Florida is, quote, openly hostile toward African-Americans, people of color and LGBTQ plus individuals and devalues and marginalizes the contributions of and the challenges faced by African-Americans and other communities of color. Now, you might remember DeSantis blocked an AP African-American studies course back in January, ultimately leading the college board, which designed that course to reverse or rather revise the curriculum. NBC's Matt Dixon is covering this for us. He's in Florida today. So, Matt, uh, how impactful is it to have the NAACP warning people not to travel to Florida? Sure. Well, it's another layer and sort of another addition of what we've seen over the past few years as DeSantis and Florida have really leaned into the culture wars. It's important, to, the, the framing, I, I kind of like to think about it. This isn't really the starting line of some of these things, but more of a continuation. Um, the League of United Latin American Citizens and Equality Florida, the organizations that, that represent LGBT, LGBTQ communities in Florida, have also put up sort of similar travel restrictions out there. So this is really a fight with organizations that represent kind of marginalized communities and people of color versus DeSantis, and, and those groups are, are saying collectively the common thread among their messages, if DeSantis continues going down this road, it's going to not only take Florida back to, you know, the 1950s is, is what the NAACP has said, but also so now the sort of broader conversation is he, he continues to, to likely, you know, become roll out his presidential campaign later this week. With, with all that's going on here in Florida now, the fight with Disney, which pulled thousands of jobs out of that state or, or decided not to bring them there last week, there's criticism now from these civil rights groups, as you laid out, the constant attack from the former president, Donald Trump. Is all of this complicating things for DeSantis as he gets ready to launch this presidential bid in any, any day now? Sure. I don't think his team sees these things as complicating in a Republican presidential primary. I think they've been talking about these things for a long time, and it's really helped Governor DeSantis go from a, a governor of one state to sort of a national Republican personality and someone who is known by conservative base voters across the country. So I think they think they're in a pretty good position as far as his record and his message for a Republican, for a primary electorate. The question is going to be if he can get through that primary 
what is this going to mean in the general election? Has he gone too far to the right? Has he sort of relied too much to build a personal brand on culture wars and, and not things that might speak to more independent voters or, or those, you know, Republicans who aren't necessarily see themselves as culture warriors? So that's ultimately going to be the question moving forward. Primary, I think they're good. The general election is, is going to be a more interesting question, of course, if he can get there. All right, Matt Dixon with us tonight. Matt, thank you. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to all of them, our foreign desk has done it for you. So here are some of the things they're keeping an eye on in a segment we call The Global. In El Salvador, at least 12 people were killed and an unknown number hurt in a stampede at a soccer stadium. A playoff match was well underway there when this chaos erupted. It's a 44,000-seat venue. El Salvador's president is promising a thorough investigation here, saying, quote, the culprits will not go unpunished. In Spain, the chief of the Spanish Soccer Federation admitted today that the league has a racism problem. This comes a day after an ugly incident during a match between Real Madrid and Valencia. Several fans were heard hurling racist insults toward a black Brazilian player. Real Madrid has lodged a hate crime complaint with Spain's attorney general. At least one fan has been banned for life from Valencia's stadium. The club says... It's searching for others who may have been involved. And in Italy, climate activists turned the waters of Rome's famous Trevi Fountain black to protest government subsidies of fossil fuels. They used diluted charcoal as a part of the scene here. It took about 20 minutes for police to pull the protesters out of the fountain, all with a crowd of locals and tourists looking at what was happening. Well, can a 150-year-old law be used to fix the debt limit? We are looking at the 14th Amendment in tonight's breakdown. Stay with us. So we've told you that President Biden is meeting with Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy right now. They're talking about raising the debt ceiling. But if they can't make a deal, can the president raise it himself without Congress? Well, some Democrats are asking Biden to consider that move by invoking the 14th Amendment. It's never been done before, and even the Treasury Secretary wonders if it would even work. Hallie actually has a look for us at what you need to know in tonight's breakdown. Every day, the U.S. gets closer and closer to running out of cash to pay its bills. And if the president and congressional leaders can't get to a deal to get those debts paid, there's this really historic and pretty controversial move the president could make. I have been considering the 14th Amendment. The president referring to a 150-year-old amendment put into place right after the Civil War. It's not overall related to finance. Its intention was to protect people who were previously enslaved. But there's this section inside the 14th Amendment saying the validity of the public debt of the United States shall not be questioned. That's important because now some experts think that phrase gives the president the ability to go around Congress to pay the country's bills, even though typically it's Congress that has the power of the purse. I would hope that the president will take executive action if the House refuses to do its job. It's not a slam dunk. Far from it. It's legally questionable. Um, whether or not that's a viable strategy. No president has ever tried to use the 14th Amendment to prevent a debt default. In other words, to make sure the U.S. does pay its bills. The problem is it would have to be litigated. And experts agree, saying if the president does try this, it probably will get tied up in court. He's quite right that he would almost certainly be sued. And I think he is concerned that there would be uncertainty, that it would... Uh, unsettle the markets. But President Biden has made one thing clear. Default is not an option. We will not default. Now, President Biden said yesterday that he believes he has the authority to use the 14th Amendment, but time will tell if he ends up trying to do that. And we thank Hallie for uh, helping us understand what's happening here. We're going to end the hour back on Capitol Hill. And uh, in the next few minutes, we do expect to hear from House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. He's supposed to be giving us his take on how his talks with President Biden to prevent the debt ceiling uh, crisis from coming to fruition. Uh, he had been expected to speak at the White House before he was supposed to be back at the Capitol for a 7 p.m. Eastern news conference. So far, no word on that. Scott Wong is at the Capitol at his post for us, joining us now. So, Scott, uh, what do you know about what's happening at this point? What's your understanding of the game plan for McCarthy speaking at the White House and at the Capitol tonight? 
Well, the fact that they have been meeting the president and the Speaker of the House for uh, just about an hour, I think, is, is a good sign. Uh, there was no abrupt end to the meeting, no storming out of the Oval Office, and so I think we can take that as a relatively good sign. But we should know more in a few minutes when uh, the Speaker talks to re reporters just outside the White House and then later uh, just outside of his Speaker's office when he returns here to the Capitol. Now, Kevin McCarthy has been saying all day long that time is of the essence, time is running out. Uh, Janet Yellen has uh, reiterated her June 1st deadline when she says it is highly likely that uh, the United States will potentially default on its uh, obligations, uh, financial obligations. And so uh, there is uh, a little bit of worry inside the Capitol today that uh, that time is running out and that uh, the two sides really only have uh, the next sort of few days to strike a deal before the, you know, the Congress is really up against the wall. These things, of course, take time uh, not only to, to get uh, the writing into legislative form, but then to bring it to the, to the floor of the House of Representatives and then send it over to the United States Senate. Uh, and eventually to the president's desk, okay? So uh, this is a, a, a choreography that needs to happen, and right now we simply uh, don't have a deal in hand, Aaron. All right, Scott Wong for us at the Capitol. And for the benefit of those of you who are watching, uh, just to give you an idea of what you're looking at here, this is a live picture from the driveway uh, at the White House. This is what we call a stakeout camera. And essentially, this is a spot where people who go in to meet with the president can come out and talk to the reporters who have gathered there uh, at some microphones that have been set up. In this case, we are waiting for the Speaker of the House to come out and talk. We know that he also scheduled a 7 p.m. news conference. The president may also speak at some point tonight. So, of course, you can expect coverage on NBC News, uh, NBC News Now, and on our website. That's a wrap for this hour. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.